Hey guys, welcome back to Bayesian. So I hope you guys enjoyed the um, uh, longer activity we did, uh, really looking at uh, the three MCMC algorithms in detail. Um, in the next couple of units, I'll be focusing more on the HMC uh, algorithm uh, via the BRMS package, because I think it, it helps me um, kind of deliver the more statistical component rather than the coding component. So I think what I'm trying to say is uh, when we're talking about goodness of fit analysis, when we're talking about information criteria, I think it's more useful to sort of stick to one R package and that R package will primarily be BRMS that does the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo um, and talk about what it means, you know, uh, how do you think of goodness of fit in a Bayesian world? How do you think of an information criteria in a Bayesian world? I'm not saying I won't show any code at all, uh, you know, ever again for, say, a Gibbs sampler, but um, that's not going to be the primary focus. Also, uh, we're, you know, sort of moving into the middle-ish portion of the semester. So things like, you know, I'll be discussing priors, setting priors a little bit less. Uh, if somebody has a question about why I set a certain prior, um, you know, feel free to reach out, of course. But um, as we're moving through the material, we'll just be going through some things a little bit faster. Okay, so with that, talking about goodness of fit, a quick review of the all good old R squared. R squared is great, it's bounded between zero and one. Um, I know there is a subset of folks that I've worked with who care very, very deeply about the R squared um, of the model. And I think it's still, uh, you know, it's, not my favorite goodness of fit measure, but it's one that uh, has a pretty nice interpretation. So as far as within sample, as far as within sample goodness of fit measures go, the R squared is as popular as it gets. So it is formally sum of squares of the model, sum of squares total, uh, the sum of squares uh, of the model and total basically is the square deviations from the grand uh, mean of the outcome variable. And here's a way to sort of heuristically think about it. Um, I can fit these data that I deliberately made nonlinear, the points there are nonlinear. I can fit a straight line through them, or I can fit a curvilinear line through them really carefully picking off the, um, those, um, the patterns. The line on the right, the red line, is more squiggly. So therefore, the variance of the fitted values, which by the way, the fitted value is just our mean mu. All right, we, we write our models as mu equals alpha plus beta x. Or when we talked about the Michaelis-Menten model, it was something like this. But our fitted value is just this, um, the, the combination of our x variable and our two parameters. That's our fitted value. That's the equation of the red line or the, you know, the blue line on the left. So the red line is more squiggly. So it has a greater um, variance of the fitted values but the variance of the outcome has stayed the same. So the, the um, example on the right has a higher R squared because it has a greater uh, variance of the outcome. Another way to think about it is your outcome accommodates the variability in the data more than the left-hand side. So therefore it will have a higher R squared, a greater proportion of variability that can be explained by the model. So there's a, a couple of small but important um, uh, things to think about when we're dealing with a Bayesian R squared. So specifically that we have a distribution of coefficients. That's the posterior distribution. The distribution of our coefficients is, is the posterior distribution. Of course, our coefficient also have a prior distribution, but our priors are updated with the data, with the information that we have gathered to make a posterior distribution. So it makes sense that the, the lines I have up on the screen, the blue line and the red line, are then just one of the infinite number of possible lines I could have fit based on the estimates from our posterior. 
right? I could have made as many of these lines as I have samples in my posterior. Some lines are going to fit worse, some lines are going to fit better. So this another way to think of the Bayesian R squared, again, remember the fitted, the fitted value is just the mean mu. And we know from even the first homework assignment that you can have a posterior distribution of the means that you guys put together for the Weibull case. So I can rewrite this as your sample of mu, the variance of that, variance of your mu's plus the variance of your residuals. And the residuals, of course, are what you observed minus what you predicted. And we can divide the top and the bottom by the variance of your mu's. And if you divide the top and bottom by the variance of the mu's, we get something that looks like this. So this ratio is on the bottom. Okay. Now we know the variance of your outcome, you're the variance of your predicted values, especially when I go back here, right? The variance of your outcomes very much depends on the posterior variance of your um, parameters. And we know that you can set your priors to be very, very informative, which will induce that variance to be lower. You can set your priors to be very, very uninformative. Sometimes you could even set your prior, your prior variability to be infinite. Um, although it's not particularly recommended, you can do it. So it's possible that the variance of your fitted values, the variance of your mu's, will be greater than the variance of the outcome. which will lead to an R squared value of greater than one, which really messes with the interpretation of the R squared. All right, we want to be able to interpret the R squared as the proportion of total information um, in Y, in your outcome Y, that could be attributed to the relationship you specified in your model. So if we, if we write it down like this, it keeps our um, R squared uh, between zero and one. Um, and of course, as the model gets better, the variance of our residuals goes down to zero. And then our Bayesian R squared approaches one. In my little heuristic example, um, the residuals are of course much lower on the right. All the residuals are much lower on the right. Again, just a quick review, the residuals of the vertical distances um, from every data point to your line. And it's clear that you are avoiding these big values over here in this space and this space. And so the variance of the residual is going to be far lower on the right. Again, naturally leading to a higher R squared. I may have just explained it, you know, way too long for something that you guys have, you know, already kind of understanding. So let's go into R. I'll be using the height example out of the book. The first example just takes the adult heights and we're looking at the simple correlation of the weight of the individual with the height of the individual. You will notice that, that I am uh, centering and scaling each weight. So this is now turning it into a Z-score. And just as a quick frequentist model for reference. So per standard deviation of weight, per standard deviation of weight, um, height increases by 5.8 centimeters. Um, and this is, of course, the average height in centimeters for the entire data set. So uh, the model I'm fitting is by BRMS. Uh, you guys sort of should be following along uh, with my code. Um, here is my formula. The intercept is included automatically. I can take a look 
um, all of what I um, can assign priors to in my formula. So uh, I can assign a prior to all of my betas. I can assign a prior to my intercept. I can assign a prior to the sigma. These are the default priors. We want to avoid the default priors. Not to say these are necessarily bad priors, but we still don't want somebody else setting priors for us. Here is a, a set of sensible priors. You can call these weakly informative. Sensible priors is not a technical word. Uh, weakly informative will be the technical word. So of course, I am centering my intercept on the average of y. And I'm assigning a reasonable uh, prior standard deviation. Uh, because I've centered and scaled my covariate, I can um, center the prior for my betas at zero. I, I feel five is a pretty fair prior standard deviation. I'm going to go with the exponential for my uh, sigma. And of course, by the way, the exponential uh, point 0.1, if you ever want to know, if you ever forget how the exponential distribution works, you can just take a bunch of random samples from um, an exponential point 0.1, as I've done right here on screen, and verify that, that is the, this has a mean of 10, so 1 over point 0.1, median of 6. Uh, and you can kind of get a sense of the first quartile and the third quartile. So this is doing a super quick prior predictive simulation of what an exponential point 0.1 implies about the magnitude of your sigma. Um, I won't rerun the model because it has the potential of crashing. So the model is already pre-run for us. Um, and if I go back um, to my uh, notes here, I can output the posterior estimates. And if I look at, say, the first six posterior estimates, you can see that there's some variability in my intercept. There's some variability in the coefficient of censored and scaled height. And there's some variability in sigma. So specifically, the first two columns each specify a different regression line, right? Each one of these is a slightly different regression line. If I, uh, and I have some code in, that has been uploaded, if I graph the first 100 MCMC samples, and by the way, if we are converging to a distribution, we have showed that our uh, chains have converged is should it matter which 100 MCMC samples I'm taking, the first 100, the fifth 100, the 55th 100. If we are sampling from the posterior, then the first 100 are just as good as the last 100. Just saying. If I now graph the 100 regression lines that are implied by the first 100 MCMC samples of the intercept and the slope, I have the picture up on the screen there. I have this handy dandy function called Bayes R squared, or Bayes R2 of my model object. And it outputs the Bayesian R squared of 0.566. But interestingly, it also outputs the credible interval for the Bayesian R squared. So that's fairly different from our frequentist world. In the frequentist world, R squared does not have a confidence interval. In a Bayesian world, the R squared certainly does have a credible interval. Why does it have a credible interval? Because there is some variability in how well our regression lines, of which 100 of which I'm showing right here, are fitting the data. So typical or you know, likely where 95%, uh, there's 95% chance that R squared will fall in between 52 and 61%. And so our interpretation is, um, if I'm using the posterior median, 56.6% of variability in the outcome variable, which is height, can be attributed, I'll be abbreviating, to the specified relationship with weight. 56.6% of, of the variability in height can be attributed to the specified relationship with weight. We have specified a linear relationship. You can say the linear relationship with weight. 56.6 um, is halfway between 100, 0 and 100. Um, but 
here's one way to think about it that I am proposing. I think that we shouldn't buy too much into the uh, R squared because if we buy into the R squared, we are giving ourselves, we're basically setting ourselves up for overfitting. If you build your models with the thought of, I'm gonna make my R squared as large as I possibly can, you will be overfitting the data because you are um, fitting your model based on your observed data and then you're using your observed data to evaluate the model fit. So it's not really doing anything to account for the fact that there's some observation out there you haven't observed yet. It's not accounting the, that uncertainty into your Bayesian R squared. Now, that's true for all R squared, but um, Dr. Gelman says that Bayesian R squared is less susceptible to overfitting than frequentist R squared. Why? Priors, right? If we build our priors correctly, we're building our priors of the for the world from which we observed a single realization of the data. So we observed a certain range of heights, but our priors should account should allow for a greater range of data than what we have observed. And this makes the Bayesian square slightly less susceptible. I still wouldn't be paying too much attention because it is a descriptive measure that is strongly based on your sample and is not a predictive measure in the same way as information criteria are. Information criteria we're gonna talk about probably in the next lecture. So the way I personally think of, and this is my opinion, my, uh, I'd like to think education, educated opinion, I think the R squared is telling you how much is out there. So when you're going out there and you're collecting data and you suppose you're super interested in, in, in uh, explaining the variability in height and uh, you started by only collecting the weight, right? There is a, there is a certain amount of resources that requires. Measuring data takes resources, time, money, graduate students, postdocs, whatever. So with this particular analysis, it looks like about half of the, of the uncertainty in the outcome is out there for you to explain. This could be done with the same exact variable, just its squared term. This could be done with uh, accounting for the person's gender. This could be done with accounting for the person's interaction between uh, weight and gender, or you need a whole separate set of uh, survey items to measure their, for example, dietary intake. Point is, about half the information is accounted for by just a single covariate. That's pretty good. But half the information is still out there for us. So I like to think of it as more of what we're missing, how much we are missing, than how much we actually know, than the, some kind of a quality of the model, right? I think uh, model quality, when we talk about the goodness of fit, um, I really want to get you away from thinking that R squared measures how, you know, if I built a good model? That's, that's a really complicated question. A single number is not gonna tell us that, but the R squared is gonna tell us about how much is left out there for us to explain. Okay, let's move on to a closely related topic, but that's called uh, posterior predictions. So if we go back to how we write models, in terms of an uh, observation index i, we say that the ith observation comes from a normal distribution with its own ith mean and some common standard deviation sigma. And then the mean is a combination of an alpha term, a beta term, and some ith value of x or a combination of, of uh, covariates that are unique to this ith observation. So suppose we are we're looking at the distribution, right? This is a distribution for each observation. Suppose we're looking at the distribution of the third observation. Well, the third observation, because we have generated, in this case, 6,000 samples, the third observation will have 6,000 posterior samples informing this distribution, right? 
The third distribution is based on the fact that we're looking at a person that is quite, that does not weigh very much, right? Two standard deviations below average weight. So that is unique to the third observation, but the rest, right? We're using the estimated betas. We're using the estimated alphas. Those are not unique to the third observation. And I might be giving you the obvious, but to build the, the distribution of this observation, we're not using just the information for that observation. We're using, we're fitting our line using all of the data points. And so if I'm, if I'm making a prediction for the third observation, I'm using the global sigma, right? This doesn't have an I, this doesn't have an I index. I'm using the global estimate of alpha and I'm using the global estimate of beta. Because I'm in a Bayesian world, I have built up a posterior distribution for all three of these parameters. And this makes the third observation have a Posterior predictive distribution. So here is a one way for us to visualize that, and the code is is uh, is up. You know, I have this code of how to do this. So this is a plot of a matrix. This is a the number of MCMC samples by n matrix. So it has as many rows as there are MCMC samples, and it has as many columns as I have observations. So one thing that is clear, clearly visible, there's of course, as expected, a lot more variability across observations because we're looking at the heights of different people. So left, right variability. Then there is within observation. And actually, if you look very closely, what I actually have inside of each little column is a trace plot. Each column is a trace plot. of mu i hat, which is, of course, the combination of alpha, beta, and all the alphas, all the betas, and that particular x, right? So there's a, there's a bit of no, it looks like the columns are slightly noisy because it looks like uh, a turned around trace plot that we hope has converged and we have tools to, to decide if it has converged. We can zoom in on the first three observations and we get, if we sort of collapse, each column, All right, so this is visualizing this predictive normal distribution. Why is it normal? That was our likelihood, right? It was specified by our likelihood. If my likelihood was Poisson, then these would be Poisson. If my likelihood was a gamma, then this would be a gamma. It depends on what the likelihood you specify would be. So here, I'm just zooming in on the first three observations. We collapse um, each of the columns together into a histogram. And here are our posterior predictions for the first three observations. Now, I'm also telling you that the true value was 151 centimeters, the true value was 139, and the true value was 136. Interestingly, those do not fall into the posterior predictive distributions. But again, how surprised should we be? We're basically slicing this graphic and we're looking at, well, where does this observation fall into the posterior predictive, predictive distribution? The, 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 this model doesn't fit the data set perfectly. In fact, about half the variability is unaccounted for. So perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that the first three observations, I don't know how far away from the mean they are, the first three observations are off the scale. So one of the best 
things about making a distribution of our mu's. We can look at the functions of our observed data. So take, you know, y bar, the median of, of, uh, um, of, of our outcomes. I can take the standard deviation of my outcomes. I can take the range, et cetera, and compare these to the same functions of my posterior predictions. I now have a whole dis posterior distribution of my predictions. All right, here's the first sample. Here is the 6,000 sample. In this case, I took 6,000 MCMT samples. And I can summarize these any way I want. I can summarize these using a mean, a median, a standard deviation. I can look at them uh, overall or by some grouping in the data. So that is something that an R squared can't tell us. And that is something that an information criteria can tell us. We'll be able to see how well our model fits in various subgroupings. Suppose your data comes from you taking uh, a vaccine trial a COVID vaccine trial, and your data comes from several hospitals, from several states. You can use the posterior predictive check, right, and summarize the average effectiveness, however you define it, by hospital and or by state. And if, you, if your model doesn't fit well in a particular hospital or a particular state, you can think about then why, you know? Why is that the case? My, missing a variable? Is, it, is there a demographic differences? And I need to then account for these demographic differences. Did something go wrong with the vaccine trial there? You know, most vaccine tr trials are double blind. So the nurses that are administering the, the trials, and I'm not saying that the current COVID trials are double blind. I don't know the answer to that question, but a lot of trials, clinical trials, are in fact double blind. So the nurses administering the trial don't know what they're giving the patient. The uh, an active vaccine or a placebo. So it's possible mistakes happen. And this can help us determine what exact hospital our model doesn't fit well in. Does lack of fit, is lack of fit always indicative of a mistake? No, but it directs us to investigate what is happening with a particular, right? What is happening with a particular set of observations? What is special and unique about that set of observations that our model that maybe fits well everywhere else is not picking up? Okay, so you guys remember how I said the BRMS package makes generating these um, uh, plots really easy? There's something called the PP check function and you just feed it your model object, what kind of predictive check you wanna run and how many samples from the posterior you're gonna take. If you remember, in my very first uh, figure, I took 100 samples from the posterior. Here, I'm keeping going uh, because I am I'm also taking 100 samples from the posterior. So this is for the, my heights data set as a whole. Here is my observed um, my observed height in I don't know why my curse my um, stylus stopped working, but we're gonna get through it. All right, so here, it, here is the observed heights. And they're represented with a smooth histogram, right? Y is the observed data, right? So it's this curve right there. My stylus refuses to operate. The light green lines are what are 100 samples from the posterior that is implied with our line. So the question we're gonna ask is, is the observed data set a plausible realization from the posterior? So I think looking at this, the answer would be maybe. Why do I say maybe? A keen observer might detect that there are two modes in my real data. And you might imagine, remember, this particular, we're looking at human height, and our model currently only includes weight, does not include gender or sex if we're looking at biological characteristics. Certainly does not include, you know, occupation or dietary intake or how athletic this person is. 
So we have two modes, but our model doesn't see the two modes. You can see our models modes actually fall right in between. So it's like our model is averaging out the differences between these two modes, which you probably can figure out. These are men and women. I think it's a, uh, this particular example is, is not of a, of a uh, developed country. It's in a developing country. It's not even uh, uh, our author is an anthropologist. So uh, this comes to us from the developing world. So it's not surprising that men would be taller than women. Our model doesn't see that though. Our model doesn't see that particular variable. So the predictions are going to be right in between these two uh, modes. So that's an example of lack of fit. Yeah, overall, look, our model does pretty good here in the tails. You know, pretty, our model does okay, but it can certainly be improved, especially now that you look at the, your observed data set and notice these two modes. Now, there are lots of lots, maybe 20 or so functions that are built in. Here's one that I like because it helps pick up skewness in the data. This is the ECDF or the empirical CDF. empirical cumulative distribution function. It basically reads off the percentiles of your data versus the percentiles of your fitted values. And this fits very well. But if you only looked here, you would actually miss the two modes, right? You don't have any modes here because you're just looking at the percentiles. So you have to look at multiple functions of your observed data and your predictions to possibly catch something like this where you have two modes. This empirical CDF reports that your model fits incredibly well. Yes, very much so is this model a plausible realization from the posterior. All right. What about median heights? So here, I, uh, what, what we do is we take the observed median height, which is somewhere between 154 and 154 and a half centimeters, and we generate 100 median heights. From the posterior. So our observed height falls in towards the middle of the 100 median heights that are produced by the posterior. So yes, that this looks like the observed median is a plausible realization. Keep it going. Uh, the next one is the standard deviation. Looks like we're capturing the standard deviation quite well. So here's an interesting one. You are actually allowed to write in whatever function you see fit. And some of you who know me, some of you who've had me for introductory statistics class, know I, I have an affinity for the interquartile range. I think interquartile range is an underappreciated little function. So here I wrote my own function for interquartile range, and here is the posterior predictive check of the interquartile range. So look, my observed interquartile range clearly falls away from the middle of this distribution. So I would say no. This is not a plausible realization from the posterior. And in fact, we underestimate the interquartile range. Think back to the last time you looked at a frequentist model and were able to, using a single plot, pick up the fact that you were underestimating the interquartile range. And about half of you are going, why do we care? Why do we care about the interquartile range? But um, this is a simple example of what is possible, not only in the Bayesian world, but also using these uh, uh, posterior predictive checks. All right. so. We detected possible lack of fit, and you know I'm, I, I would not be doing my job if I didn't tell you, show you how to fix it. So for example, let's go ahead and include um, sex. I'm assuming this particular data set has the you know sex as a biological characteristic. So this is just the sex of each individual. And I want to kind of spend a, a tiny bit of time on, well, how does this affect our priors if we're being really careful? Can I get away with setting these priors to be whatever? Probably, because I have something like 500 observations. So 
my posterior will be dominated by uh, the likelihood. But what if you are working with a, a tougher example, like what I had you do with the Michaelis Menton model with only seven observations? You have to be really careful how you set your priors. So formally, if I now introduce a dummy variable where if my, our if person is male, it takes on a value of one. And if my if person is female, it takes on a value of zero. What is the intercept measuring now? So the intercept is the average height for a female, right? It's the average female height. This is, um, excuse me, that, that was unclear notation. Alpha is now the average female height. When we set our covariate to zero and we set male equal to zero, it's going to pick off the average female height. What's a reasonably weakly informative prior? So a normal, and then this would be observed average female height. And I don't know, some reasonable prior standard deviation. I pick 50. As a quick review, what, what is beta then measuring? Well, we'll cover that in just a second. So I fit my model. Here is my output. Uh, it, you know, effective sample size looks incredible because this is still a fairly simple model. Uh, my credible intervals look reasonable as uh, weight increases. This is the predicted change in height per standard deviation in weight. Why standard deviation? Because I have z-scores. So what, how do I interpret this beta coefficient, beta of being male? Well, the beta of being male is our estimated differences or posterior median differences between male and female heights. adjusted for weight. Regardless of weight, this will be the difference between male and female heights. So I'm saying that men are about six and a half centimeters taller than women when we adjust for weight. Everything is statistically significant for those that are playing along at home. These um, do not contain uh, zero is not uh, inside of any of these credible intervals. So in a traditional sense, we would say um, all of our coefficients are statistically significant. Everything has converged. These are the chubby caterpillars that I talk about. And here I'm setting the weekly informative priors for my alpha. Uh, the average female height that was observed was 149.5 centimeters. I, uh, I did not change the prior standard deviation or the rest of the prior. So did we correct the slow boo-boo? We did. Look, the model no longer appears that the model now takes care of the two modes separately and no longer sort of averages out the difference between male and female heights. Also, it looks like we corrected just a touch what's going on in, in this tail. So this is, this is fitting really well. This is really good fit. And you see, I haven't even looked at the R squared that's on the screen. So before I, I accounted for uh, being male versus female, my R squared is 57%, posterior median. Now my R squared is almost 70% and can be anywhere between 66 and 72%. So weight and being male versus female accounts for about 70% of the variability in heights. Remember, I can look at whatever groupings of my data make sense to me. So now that I have um, accounted for men versus women, I can include this grouping in my posterior predicted check. And this looks like pretty good fit. 
you know, am I thrilled with this? I'm not thrilled with that. Looks like we're, oh, maybe, you know what? Let's not overinterpret. This is okay fit. The, the true uh, average heights for men and women fall towards the center of our posterior uh, predicted distributions. Um, you know, if you wanted to increase this to something like a thousand or 10,000, we could probably uh, make an even more precise comparison. All right, rolling right along. Well, some of you might, might say, well, is, is the relationship not curvilinear? Our author certainly thinks it is. So when we go back to the full data set, our author starts to add these terms, which is just our um, weights squared with their own coefficient to account for possible nonlinear relationships. So how does this affect the shape of the relationship? If our quadratic coefficient is greater than zero, we have a concave up relationship. And if our quadratic coefficient is less than zero, we will have a concave down relationship. If our quadratic, quadratic coefficient is approximately zero, we of course then uh, come back to the good old linear model. The rest of the priors all look reasonable. You know, if I was really worried, I might run a prior predictive simulation on this. Um, I did not. Uh, but the, I still claim these are fairly reasonable priors. Thinking about height on the scale of centimeters. Chubby, chubby, beautiful, viridis plotted caterpillars. Everything looks good. Beautiful, beautiful, effective sample size. Um, look at my Bayesian R squared estimate. At this point, I have male versus female, weight and squared weight in the model. That explains 96% of the variability in my heights. There's only 4% that's left over out there. If I want to start to asking people what they do for a living, if I want to start asking people how much food they eat, how much protein they eat. So what this would mean to me is I probably, it's not worth my time or resources to start you know, asking about their diet in this particular case, because this particular model explains about 96% of the observed variability. Our uh, current model, here is my estimated coefficient for squared weight. Remember, this is now going to be concave down. But our model, unlike the author's model, also includes gender. So a little test of your regression knowledge. All right, this is weight. All right, this is height. I'm going to have a I'm going to have a solid line for the men and I'm going to have a dashed line for the women. All right? Both lines, I have no interactions in the model. Both lines are going to be concave down and separated by the male coefficient. So, what I will have is on the bottom women tend to be shorter but concave down because of my squared term. Men are gonna be parallel and equally curvilinear, separated at every point by the male coefficient. So that is the state of our current universe. What if I now add a cubic term? Oh, look, the cubic term is added. Oh, look, the cubic term is significant. Did I make an incredible contribution to science? by showing there's a cubic effect. Oh, look, my Bayesian R squared has increased. Where should I go ahead and add a quartic or a, or a quintic or even a sextic? No, you certainly shouldn't unless you are coming up with a valid scientific question of why we would ever care about those terms. Back here with a quadratic model, we're showing that only 4% is out there for us to explain. So any possible combination of unobserved and observed covariates are only going to help you between 96 and 100%. It's just not worth your time. Where should we stop? The answer lies in the information criteria. So that's this sets up. Uh, looks like I'm just starting to point to stuff and, and mess with stuff. This sets up our next lecture when we're going to talk about information criteria. 
I will first cover information criteria from a frequentist world because the Bayesian information criteria follow the frequentist world fairly closely. So with that, I'm going to thank you for your time. Y'all stay safe. I'll talk to you next time. Thank you, guys.